Hi, this is the overview video for chapter 14, Fluid Mechanics. Now, the way we cover the topics in this class, uh, we cover this at the very end of the semester. The fluid mechanics is what you will see in our very last uh, instruction of the coda semester, week 16. So as a kind of consequence of that, you will see us not spend a lot of time on all the sections of uh, chapter 14. I would say in terms of homework materials, you are going to see homework materials that would relate to sections 14.1 through 14.4, uh, just uh, briefly. And section 14.5 and 14.6, I think I do have some lecture material on that, but you either have no homework question or maybe just one homework question. And chapter 14.7, uh, sorry, section 14.7, we don't cover it at all. I mean, I, so I think everything here is good for you to skim through just so that you have an idea of uh, what's covered in lower division fluid mechanics. But ultimately, I would say um, if a fluid mechanics is the kind of material that you have to know in your future chosen mer uh, uh, major, maybe you are dealing with this in the upper division, dealing with something having to do with the fluid mechanics, or in your field chosen field of study, maybe you're a civil engineer and you have to model flow of water through them. Uh, in those cases, you are frankly have to, gonna have to teach yourself a lot of fluid mechanics anyway. So there's nothing that we really could have covered in this one week that'll um, come to any level of that. So <laughs> uh, on the other hand, if your chosen field of study doesn't involve fluid mechanics, then you know you can skip this entire week and you didn't hurt anything. So, so that's my justification why we are going through this so quickly and not spending a lot of time. Uh, one reason is that we are at the end of the semester and we don't have a lot of time. And I think the nature of fluid mechanics being what it is, I think uh, uh, my our role here really is to give you some exposure to the topics. And that's it. And uh, if you don't need it, great. You can forget about it forever. If you need it in the future, you will have to do your own study anyway. Uh, and hopefully some of the exposure you had here helped you. So with that, let me just uh, kind of scroll through the sections and uh, point out some things that we do kind of put a little bit more emphasis and tell you which ones you can safely skip. So section 14.1 deals with some conceptual aspect, some terminology that become important in dealing with the fluid mechanics, some of the chemistry stuff that you might already know, but um, the purpose of introductory section like this is to put everyone on the same page, whether you are in a science class that talked about solids and fluids or not. Hey, we are talking about it here, so you can learn about it. Uh, so what we t refer to as fluids would be uh, liquids and gas. They um, have um, the similar kind of property in the way we handle it here. So. And uh, we introduced the density. You might have already um, known about it. This is where we officially talk about density. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, the definition of density. This is the letter here, one that looks like a P. It's not P, it's Greek letter rho. Uh, it's written with one stroke going up, uh, round the top, and that way. Uh, it's de defined as mass per volume. Quite simple, amount of mass per volume. So I guess one distinction to make between density and mass is that mass is a property of an object. You take an object, it has some amount of mass. You uh, take a different object, like different cell phone, then it'll have different mass. But if you have a given substance, it'll have a relatively well-defined density that you can list on a table like this. Aluminum has this density. And um, so, you know, some of this might vary a little bit, you know, blood density might vary a little bit. If you are diabetic, maybe your blood density is higher. I don't know. Um, but um, so density is a property of substance that you can put in a table, look it up for a calculation. Mass, you could have never imagine doing that. Um, so, yeah, more densities. And uh, this picture is showing how we try to handle uh, kind of fluid elements. I do have a lecture kind of that talks about fluid elements and how that's useful in applying the principles of mechanics you've been learning so far into this new setting. You can watch that if you're interested. Um, yeah, okay, those infinitesimal size. Uh, and we also define pressure. So pressure is now necessary to deal with things like this uh, small fluid element. 
for those fluid element it's useful to talk about not just the force but force per area that you can imagine is acting on a little fluid element how is it accelerating and so on. so we define pressure now these are things that you might have known before um, but it's good to have uh, one section that covers all these terminologies formulas topics um, so that everyone's on the same page um, uh, I think a unit of fluid, uh, uh, that, uh, pressure, I talked about that very first week. This was my example of differences in approach uh, in terms of units between physics and chemistry. Um, good. And variation of pressure in the depth, uh, with the depth in the fluid of constant. Yeah, so I think I do a derivation of that. You can kind of do this with uh, how much force is on this bottom surface divided by area. That will give you the formula. Now, the surprising thing about that is it's really more general than this uh, kind of cylindrical shape. If you have a differently shaped container, this formula that you drive here will still be valid for that different shaped thing. And I think your textbook does go over that a little bit. This is a great example. You might have seen something like this in a, your calculus class. I'm sorry we don't go through something like this for homework, but you know nothing stops you from working through this. This is a great calculus practice. So I do highly recommend it. Wait, why isn't this? Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. They are using... Oh, so they are doing this in a way where they don't have to use calculus. Uh, all right, I guess uh, you could do that. Um, but one fun thing to do is use calculus, like pressure at the top all the way to the pressure at the bottom. But, um, your, okay, your textbook didn't do it that way. Kind of boring. Uh, that's fine. Um, oh, and uh, now they are using calculus here. Okay. Um, uh, so what this is showing is um, this little fluid element here, this thin sheet here. There must be equal force from the top as from the bottom. And with the pressure, I think a lot of us are used to think of, thinking of it as being directed downward. And what I will tell you is that there's this upward force that's also associated with pressure. And in fact, later in the section, it gives you a more concrete term. So let's say pressure in the field with the constant density. Yeah, that's kind of the formula that you had way up there. And uh, yeah, this uh, example, we don't quite look at it, you know, where your pressure might vary as a, or density might vary as a function of height. Um, that's a, an excellent calculus practice. You can do that. Uh, we won't do that. <laughs> but, you know, look through this. I think that's a great exercise for you to look at. Uh, ah, direction of pressure in the fluid. So this is something that might take a while for people to understand. Fluid pressure has no direction, being a scalar quantity. Pressure is a scalar. Even though we associate with a, with a force, you know, force per area, pressure is not a vector. It's a scalar. And to get the direction of a, a force due to pressure, what you really have to do is you get the uh, surface normal. You know, what direction is perpendicular to the surface you're considering. That gives you the direction of force, which is a vector quantity. But pressure itself is a scalar. It doesn't have a direction. And that kind of goes with what I mean. This expression here is a lot more general than you might have imagined. So we drive this thinking about force acting on this bottom surface downward, applies for upward, and in fact the pressure that we calculate, that will end up giving you the force on the walls as well. Pressure is a scalar. So this is a long section, it covers a lot. Uh, section 14.2, I believe is a kind of a practical thing. It talks about gauge pressure versus absolute pressure. It's a, a good distinction for you to be aware of. I think uh, now it's a while ago. Was it 10 years ago? There was something called the deflate gate about a football quarterback who was accused of deflating footballs. And there were like prominent physicists who came on TV talk shows and talked about how, you know, with the amount of temperature change, you wouldn't get that kind of pressure change. And here's the thing. They were wrong. They made the mistake of confusing gauge pressure with the absolute pressure. And the arguments they were making would have made sense for absolute pressure that, you know, with the amount of temperature change, the absolute pressure wouldn't have changed that much. But gauge pressure being measured as um, so pressure, which is the pressure relative to the atmospheric pressure. So when a gauge pressure reads, uh, you know, one PSI, it's what it is really in terms of absolute pressure that matters for things like ideal gas law is one pressure, a pound per square inch plus the atmospheric pressure. 
And uh, so, you know, um, so with the gauge pressure, you can get more drastic change because you have the constant term being added. And anyway, so it's the kind of the distinction that, um, you know, it's good for you to you as a competent physicist and engineer to be aware of if you're going to talk with other people who have no idea what these things are because <laughs> you, you should have misled people. Um, most of the devices, I think, measure gauge pressure. To measure absolute pressure, the device actually has to be calibrated relatively well. Um, I, I don't think I... Uh, so when I was doing physics research, there was something called a Baratron. And I think that device actually did measure absolute pressure. And the device manufacturer actually designed it to measure that way. Uh, but a lot of the things that measure pressure, it's because uh, it's easiest to measure pressure difference between two sides. And if they don't want to bother with uh, either making one side a perfect vacuum or calibrating it uh, uh, very carefully, then it's really much easier to build a device for gauge pressure. So that's what most people do. So yeah, measuring pressure. These are all gauge pressure devices, I think. Uh, C... Uh, C might be measuring absolute pressure, <laughs> but anyways. Uh, oh, and unit of pressure. We talked about that um, actually first week of semester. Uh, Pascal is the SI unit of pressure because it has this nice relationship. Uh, we talk about section 14.3 in the lecture. Um, and I think Pascal's principle just says something that a lot of people are kind of would have guessed intuitively, you know, like given two points at the same height, the pressure is the same. Or like you have pressure at the top, pressure at the bottom, you do something to change the pressure at the top, that effect will propagate and affect the pressure at the bottom. That's what it says. Now the kind of a, a surprising application of that is for device like this it gives you some mechanical advantage, meaning with a smaller force, you can apply a larger force here. Uh, this is a kind of a, like a, a lever, but using a different physical mechanism. So I think that's it. Um, and we do cover Archimedes' principle and buoyancy. That is the last topic from chapter 14 that's required, to the extent that any chapter 14 topic is required. So this talk about uh, Archim buoyancy force, which is related to Archimedes' principle. And buoyant force uh, derivation, I love it. You see me do this in lecture. It's kind of an application of something we covered. You know, pressure as a function of height. Use that to figure out, oh, there is a net force in a fluid element like this. And, um, yeah. and Archimedes' principle kind of uh, uh, is something that he figured out experimentally without knowing anything about Newtonian mechanics because he came thousands of years before Newton. Uh, yeah, that's the Archimedes principle, and you can kind of explore these different things. Yeah, you can read that in the textbook. Now, starting with the section 14.5, so we do lecture on it. I do lecture on some aspects of fluid dynamics and Bernoulli's equation, but I don't think you will see any homework questions, or if you do, it will be just one or two questions. So uh, with the uh, char characteristics of flow, one of the most uh, important thing to realize is, is what we cover as... Um, a continuity equation or equation of continuity. It's this equation. And you can kind of follow the argument above to see that, yeah, you agree with this. And the thing that it's important in is to analyze a situation like this. When people look at this intuitively, a lot of people will think, well, this thing narrows. So I'm thinking of like a traffic in a narrowing road. So I think it'll slow down. The surprising thing is the exact opposite happens the fluid speeds up in a narrower section in order to obey this continuity principle. And uh, you can kind of think through what the mechanical um, idea behind that would be. There must be some net force, some, uh, some kind of transfer of energy. Uh, I think I do that in lecture. You can take a look at that. Uh, also, take a look at it in the textbook. And, uh, and with the Bernoulli's equation, I did do the derivation of Bernoulli's equation uh, like a semester, a year ago, using this exact picture. So you can take a look at that. You can also read the textbook. Uh, it does boil down to this principle that we call Bernoulli's principle or Bernoulli's equation. Now, um, we don't do a lot with it. If you get any homework question, maybe one homework question. But if you are dealing with any kind of basic fluid mechanics, this is a really useful expression that comes from conservation of energy. And what that means is in any setup where conservation of energy is not obeyed perfectly, this equation will also be not correct perfectly. And in fact, the exact situation where 
Bernoulli's equation will not be correct anymore would be where you have viscosity and turbulence. That's section 14.7, which you will skip entirely in lecture. I do recommend that you skim it so, so you have some idea of what's involved in viscosity and stuff. So, you know, look at that, but um, uh, you will see no homework question. Uh, it's entirely optional. So I think that, uh, uh, yeah, all this is entirely optional, but, you know, do read it. I do think it's good for people to, you know, read everything, skim everything. So with that, I think that's all the sections in sec chapter 14. Again, we skip a lot. Um, you can entirely, you can skip the entire chapter and you'll do fine in terms of the course for the semester. But I do recommend that you skim through some of it so that when you have to come back and study this again for some future job you are doing, uh, you know where to look it up.